It's uh, 4 p.m. here in Singapore. We are live from DBS Asia Central. I'm Taimur Beg, Chief Economist of DBS Group Research. Welcome to our year's first live stream session for the Macro Insights. Uh, we have a packed thing, a number of things to do today, so we will get cracking. Um, you see, we have a set of things that we want to go over. We want to go over the state of the pandemic. We want to talk about the biggest elephant in the room, which is the U.S. economy and the Fed's imperative to start hiking. And we've had some uh, changes in our calls, if you will, in terms of bringing forward some of the rate hike, like many other analysts. But we have certain analysis and insights that we want to share with you. And then, of course, what this means for the overall interest rate picture, both for the developed markets as well as in emerging markets in Asia. We want to go over that. And for that, I have with us our senior rate strategist, Eugene Liao. All of that is coming later. First thing we want to do is to run some polls, hear from you what your ideas about some of the macro themes for the year are. So what I'm first going to do is walk you through one of many ways you can take part in the polls. So for example, if you are talking to us from or watching this on your laptop or your PC, you can take out your mobile phone right now and scan the QR code that's on the screen. And that will take you to four questions that, with multiple choice answers that you can uh, participate in right away. If you are using a mobile, it's a bit difficult to scan <laughs> already if you're watching this feed. So you might as well then open up a web browser, go to pigeonhole.at or www.pigeonhole.at, type the passcode DBSGR, and that will take you to the polls. But there is a smoother third option. You can, in fact, uh, go straight to the screen that you're looking at right now because we have Pigeonhole fully integrated with the, in, uh, the screen that you're watching this presentation in. And that will then guide you through the four questions that we're talking about. So what are these four questions? Well, when we go to the screen, the first question that you will see is the following. The first pigeonhole question is, how many Fed policy rate hikes do you expect in 2022? Oh my goodness, uh, Eugene, you're in the corner of the screen. You may notice 90, 82 people have already provided about 91 votes for this. So I guess people are just jumping straight at it. Uh, options are two rate hikes this year, three, four, more than four, very hawkish. And uh, if there are no comments at all, uh, you don't have your mind made up. Maybe you want to answer this later. That's the other option for you. OK, um, so feel free. Go ahead and you know, express your view on this question. Uh, we will give you a chance to come back to this question later on in the presentation. But right now, let's go to the second question. Where will US 10-year bond yield be at the end of this quarter? OK, not at the end of this year. We're just talking about a three-month picture. On the 31st of March, where do you see the 10-year bond yield, which right now is about 1.73, 1.74? Uh, do you see it lower, 1.6, 1.7? Do you see it more or less the same, around 1.8? Or do you see it substantially higher, 1.9 or 2? Uh, express your views. I think it will be very, very informative for us. Uh, and it will be a good thing to go over toward the end of this presentation when we do this uh, final take on it. So again, if you don't have any view, and I can see 10.7% of you don't have any view right now, Listen to what we have to say, and maybe it'll help you make up your view when we revisit the poll halfway through this. Third question. From fixed income to equity markets. On a big question among investors in Asia in particular, will China's equity market bottom in 2022, having had a really, really tough 2021? And it hasn't really started out very well either. Uh, and I can see that already lots of people are hoping that the bottom is coming very, very soon or in the second half of this year. But then there are others who are a bit pessimistic. And uh, it is interesting to see that sort of spread of results as well. Uh, so again, uh, put on your answers now. And if you don't have any conviction right now, Relax, we will get you, uh, give you another chance to participate in the poll in about half an hour or so. And the final question that we would like to poll you on is on the equity market at the US side. Uh, what do you like in the US? Do you think that tech will be uh, continuing its amazing performance that we have seen in recent years? 
or do you think that it is time for reopening value stocks to come uh, into limelight? Uh, we've had false dawns of that several times in the last couple of years. Maybe Omicron is it. And then you could be pessimistic and say no upside to the U.S. equity this year. And again, you could consider these questions later on and, and so on. All right, so, so these are the four questions. Like I said, you know, we'll come back at the end of my presentation before Eugene comes in. We'll give you another chance to take part in this polls. All right, state of the pandemic. Although today's presentation is all about the Fed liftoff, we have to talk about the pandemic because no matter what your views on the Fed are and what your views on interest rates are, they will still be hugely influenced by the trajectory of the pandemic. So things are a bit hairy. Uh, we had a nice phase uh, this year, uh, last year, when infection rates were falling. I'm basically looking at now a select number of Asian economies. The green line is India, which of course has been the biggest COVID hotspot in Asia, understandable given that India is the most populous country outside of China in Asia. Uh, and uh, what you see in this chart on the horizontal axis, the stock of number of confirmed cases on the vertical axis, it's the flow. In the last five days, how many new cases have we had in these countries? And what you see is the likes of India had a steep decline and unfortunately, in the last month or two, case numbers have started going up sharply. As we speak, we're talking about a couple of hundred thousand a day, close to a million every five days in India. Uh, we all know that COVID in the form of Omicron is milder, so it probably doesn't elicit the same sort of alarm it did when Delta was spiking. Nonetheless, it comes with serious problems, even if it is not for death, but for disruption to work, from people showing up at work and not being able to come because they have COVID, mild or not. So the numbers are still instructive about the outcome for the first quarter. Uh, where else in Asia are we seeing a bit of a reversion? Uh, look at Taiwan, look at China. These are countries that seem like had won the COVID battle last year. They were uh, living very, very comfortably. But unfortunately, in the last few weeks, we have seen Omicron in particular beginning to prop up especially for a country like China, where the policy is basically one of zero tolerance to COVID, uh, even a little bit of a pickup is a problem, and that's what we're seeing there in terms of poor shutdowns and so on. Uh, the other country in Asia where there's been a major setback is the Philippines. Uh, that's the gray dotted line in this chart uh, where uh, we have seen basically the worst of the pandemic play out in the last week or so. Uh, it had gone down substantially uh, toward December over the last month or so. Uh, Omicron has really uh, wreaked havoc in Philippines and it is creating uh, major health related uh, uh, complications uh, and, and getting in the way of economic reopening. So my view is that just about every country you look at, whether it is Thailand or Indonesia, or even Singapore for that matter, some degree of flare up is inevitable. Uh, maybe some countries will be better at dealing with Omicron than others because of high rates of vaccination, because of high degree of natural immunity or a mixture of both. But then there will be cases um, uh, where even in those countries, we will see significant problems of uh, work shutdown, temporary disruption to travel, uh, and uh, as a result, economic activity in the first quarter of this year because of this spike is going to be affected uh, regardless of how much progress we have made with respect to vaccination. Same chart in the context of Western economies. Uh, US is basically now seeing uh, worst of the pandemic in terms of per capita infection. Uh, definitely not the worst in terms of death, but there has been a spike like no other. Uh, I know doctors in the US who are telling me right now that their capacities are entirely full because a lot of people who are coming to the hospital for a regular checkup or for surgery are testing positive for COVID. And the moment they do it, they have to be isolated. They have to be quarantined. And as a result, hospital capacities are being stretched like they have never been since the very early days of the pandemic. So the US is seeing that. And I fear most of the countries in chart will see it. Consider the case of Australia, superbly successful in the first year and a half of this pandemic because they were not letting anybody in, not letting anybody out. But the moment they opened up just a little bit, we now have a massive spike in a country like Australia, you know, nowhere compared to the US in terms of population, but they're seeing you know, hundreds of thousands of cases on a daily basis uh, and creating a bit of a you know, shock to the Australians who have been so well insulated for the duration of the pandemic. So I think Australia tells you then that's like the final pin in the COVID uh, coffin, if you will. 
nobody can avoid this disease. It will come to you sooner or later as a, as a nation, as a society. You just have to be ready to deal with it. Uh, and similarly, you know, you can think of country like Brazil, which had a precipitous decline in infection rate, saw, seen a big pickup. France, again, just like the U.S., is basically seeing the worst of the pandemic in terms of per capita infection. Italy, same story. U.K., same story. So the pandemic has started 2022, certainly on the wrong footing. We can talk as much as we want about how mild this latest outbreak is, but it would have to be substantially milder than Delta for it to have very little impact on livelihood and lives. Think about it this way. If a variant is twice as infectious, it would have to be half as lethal. Now, Omicron seems to be six, seven times more infectious. Is it one seventh time less lethal? Probably not. And hence, you would probably see a spike in death rates, at least in January, February. The biggest silver lining that I think the market and we also are operating with is the hope and expectation that the Omicron wave is short-lived. We've already seen this in, Australia, in uh, South Africa, where it started first, that we had a very sharp rise in infection in late November, early December. But as we speak, it's come down sharply. So let's hope and pray that next month when I come back to you, we will see a bit of a inverted U for many of these countries because infection rates will start going down. Um, now, I've already touched on this issue already, that is Omicron less lethal and less, dis less disruptive. I think, again, on a per capita basis, maybe less lethal. But if it is infecting you know, everybody in the country, then, of course, the number of deaths would be substantial. Um, look at the December data point that we have in this chart for a select number of economies. Already, death rates have started to tick up. I mean, these are not the death rates that we saw in December of 2020 or January of 2021, but it's picked up. And you can be sure when we come back to you a month from now and have the January data, it'll be substantially higher than what it is right now. So the pandemic is very much there. It's not fading anytime soon. Lethal, not lethal, notwithstanding, we have to deal with this extremely infectious variant. All right, so that's the update on the pandemic. Let's move on and start talking about the US economy and the Fed imperative, which so far seems to be largely unaffected by all the pandemic talk that I just gave you. All right, uh, this is data uh, all the way through the end of last week. So we now have December labor market data for the US. And as you can see, it tells you a very compelling story. Um, right before the pandemic, so late 2019, early 2020, the US was in a proverbial sweet spot. Um, unemployment was at record low, 3.5%. Wages had begun to show some degree of buoyancy. And you could hear from Fed officials that, you know, because inflation was not an issue, uh, how to run a high-powered economy for a prolonged phase, uh, allow people who are normally out of the labor force to come in, because that's the phenomenon that you see in late cycle, um, that, you know, initially the skilled, the uh, most uh, qualified get jobs in a cycle, but as the cycle is prolonged, uh, the best of the workforce have already gotten their jobs. Then you get the people who are minorities. And by best, I don't necessarily mean best in quality, but in terms of you know, job market suitability. But then you start seeing minorities, differently able people start getting jobs. Uh, you see Fed governor's commentaries in late 19. That's what they were talking about. Governor Brainerd, uh, Governor Yellen, Yellen, they were all talking about the need to allow the cycle to stretch as much as possible because that would allow for the minority, the downtrodden, to get more jobs. Then we had COVID, massive spike in unemployment, and particularly minority un unemployment was even higher than the chart shows. Uh, so like 20% minority unemployment, 14.7%, which was the worst of the pandemic. Since then, remarkable recovery, and my goodness, we are ending basically 2021 with unemployment rate more or less back to where it was at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, labor force is a little sh smaller. Some are discouraged workers. We can talk about that later. But the big thing is the wage growth, uh, four or five percent wage growth across the board in the economy, something that had never been seen in the past cycle at all. So between 2015 and 2020, U.S. was characterized by very strong gains in employment, but virtually no upward buoyancy in wages, whereas now we're seeing some seriously strong wage growth, which is why the Fed is becoming very, very comfortable with the labor market outlook, notwithstanding the fact that the labor force is a little smaller, that there's still a lot of discouraged workers out there. Um, so what happens on the back of a strong labor market and strong wage growth? You see housing doing well. I mean, why is housing doing well? For the same reason we have 
some degree of inflation issues, some degree of uh, jobs growth. We have ample liquidity, we have low interest rates, that's booming economic activity. And as a result, we are seeing you know, housing inventory <clears throat> may have picked up a little bit because construction has picked up, but look at Freddie Mac housing price index. We're talking about 15% increase on a year-on-year -year basis. In big cities, it's actually even higher than that. Uh, so overall, tremendous buoyancy in the housing market, which I suppose will get dampened a bit in the coming months because we have seen mortgage rates go up a lot in the last few weeks or so, but that's a story for later, not yet. We're there. As far as the Fed is concerned, they're operating with a strong labor market, strong wage growth, and a buoyant housing market and inflation. So let's go over a few slides talking about the inflationary situation. Um, so what you see here tells you that core personal consumption expenditure, so core PC preferred gauge for many of the Fed officials is uh, going up like, you know, at rates that we have not seen in living memory. Uh, you know, maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago, but you know, most economists have not seen anything like this. We're talking about close to 5% core PC inflation. Uh, given the headline inflation numbers that have been lately coming out, we probably have another month or two of higher core PC ahead of us as well. Manufacturing prices, seem to have peaked. Uh, manufacturers seem to be a little less worried about uh, some of their input prices. I'll come back to the issue a little later because it's not just about manufacturing prices that make up the economy. There are services prices and other issues as well. Um, but even after this recent correction, uh, these are elevated levels that one has to be cognizant of when one is considering monetary policy. Um, so yeah, this is the follow-up chart. Uh, ISM prices paid index. So survey of manufacturers and non-manufacturers, are you seeing prices go up? And there, while the red line, which is the previous slide as well, you saw that you know, manufacturers are saying they're not as alarmed as they were just a few months ago. Non-manufacturers, the ones who are on the services side, are actually seeing extremely elevated levels of price pressure. And that trend has not abated at all, despite the recent correction in freight rates and some concerns about China slowdown. Uh, none of those things have still yet to dampen uh, the non-manufacturer's perspective of prices. Um, what do companies and company owners say when we survey them and ask them about the inflation situation? So on the left-hand side, you have a compilation of Fed surveys. So New York Fed, Kansas City Fed, Philadelphia Fed, they all run these surveys. Uh, what kind of prices are you paying? What kind of prices are you receiving for the things that you buy and the things that you sell? And you can see that through the course of 2020 2021, the gap between prices paid and prices received widened sharply, uh, nothing that we have seen since 2010. Uh, maybe some slight degree of easing of that in the very latest data point, too early to call that the pressures are over, and the gap remains big. Either you see a big disinflation on the in input side or you start charging more as in prices received goes up. But that gap, that wide gap is unsustainable. It has to narrow. Uh, are you planning on raising prices? Yes. In fact, I can see that the range of my chart has been exceeded by the survey results. So I had the chart scaled up at 50, and the number is actually higher than 50% of those surveyed who are planning on raising uh, their uh, selling prices or have already raised prices. Both are over 50 already. So when you see this situation, you know, we know well about fuel price inflation. We know that manufactured goods, because of supply chain bottlenecks, because of strong demand, have gone up a lot. We know that soybean, palm oil, things that make a lot of food and non-food products in the world, palm oils, for example, goes into edible oil, also goes into manufacturing of toothpaste and shampoos. Soybean goes into livestock feed, but also into making tofu that billions of people eat. All of those things are showing significant elevated degree of pressure. Uh, so we have food price elevated, fuel price elevated, goods price elevated, uh, services showing signs of buoyancy. Maybe some of it is temporary, but what, no matter how temporary they are, the fact of the matter is, with respect to the US, we're looking at 7% plus headline inflation. We're looking at personal consumption expenditure inflation of close to 5% and core personal consumption expenditure at uh, also close to, well, cl PCE close to 6% and core PCE close to 5%. So these are uncomfortable numbers. Uh, regardless of how transitory you think the inflation numbers are, and now we are uh, well more than a year into talking about transitory, so can't really you know, hide behind that anymore. Uh, Fed officials need to act. 
even if their forecasting horizon suggests substantial degree of disinflation in 2023 as base effects kick in, as the supply side comes into uh, action, so fuel supply goes up, uh, global chip shortages uh, get taken care of, uh, sh freight and shipping related bottlenecks get addressed. Despite all that, we will probably not see sub 2% inflation even at the end of 2023. Uh, what we will see is not a continuation of 7% headline and 5% PC. That will come down by the end of 2022, or perhaps even by October, November 2022. Inflation rates will probably come down a lot, but there's a lot of time between January of 2022 and September, October of 2022. The Fed would have to act in between that period. Otherwise, chances of inflation expectations getting ratcheted, ratcheted up, chances of asset prices going out of control, uh, irresponsible lending, distortionary investment, all of those things become very elevated. Hence, the Fed will act. Eugene Liao will talk about that in great detail, but just let me summarize what our call is. The call is straightforward. We see the Fed hiking in March, June, and September. We are keeping one hike in our pocket, which is the winter of 2022 December hike. Why? Because of this chart. Because we see by December of 2022, the Fed will see substantial disinflation and perhaps economic growth will also slow quite a bit compared to the very strong momentum we have seen in late 20, all of 21 and most of 2022. So around that, we're seeing three hikes this year. Perhaps the realization that inflation remains substantially above 2% will dawn in in early 23 and the market will probably nudge the Fed into hiking more, which is why we also have March, June and September 2023 as part of our call. Eugene will come and talk greater detail about what that means for markets, fixed income investment strategy and so on. But I just wanted to give you the call at the very beginning. Why is it so important for the Fed to hike uh, even if within a year horizon you see inflation coming under control? Well, because the Fed is an average inflation targeter. It is looking at inflation over a medium term horizon. And if you were sitting in 2017 and wanted to target about 2% inflation over the medium term, well, by the end of 2023, you would have exceeded your goal substantially. This is a level chart. If you grow at 2% every year, where does the core PC go? And if you grow at what has happened so far and what is projected, that's the uh, line uh, in, in the blue, blue color. And that tells you that if the Fed doesn't do a lot to address inflation expectations, uh, it will look back and say that it basically missed its inflation target. So that's the major reason. Um, so considerations, scale and duration of cycle. Eugene will talk about that. Taper versus QT, meaning instead of you know, reducing the pace of asset purchase, actually starting to sell assets and reducing the balance sheet, and then what it means for asset prices. I will also address this issue a little later on the equity side, but Eugene will talk about the uh, asset price side on the fixed income angle, and then on the neutral rate question. So, so this is the sort of considerations we need to have when we think about the broader implication of the Fed's hawkish tilt that is basically baked into the market price for the rest of the year. So um, yield curves have already adjusted accordingly. You've seen substantial upward movement, uh, shift of the yield curve, both in Singapore and the US. Uh, and uh, you will see this manifest in higher mortgage rates, both countries. Housing will be affected by this. So things to keep in mind around the Fed hike narrative. All right, you remember we had uh, walked you through a bunch of questions. In case you came in late to the call, you logged in late, uh, let me just remind you that there are two ways. We're not gonna give you three ways anymore. Third option we're putting aside. There are two ways of doing this thing. You could scan the QR code on the screen right now and take part in the four questions that we have for you. We will summarize these results at the end of Eugene's presentation. Or you can just go to pigeonhole.at, type in the password DBSGR, and there, those four questions will be there as well. Uh, and uh, Eugene, uh, all yours. Thank you very much, Taimur. So, so for my presentation, I'll be talking quite a bit uh, of issues on, on what is affecting dollar rates and what, what should we be expecting from the Fed. And I think a lot of us got conditioned into a very dovish Fed because that has been the case since the pandemic in early 2020. And a dovish Fed just means rate cuts and QE. Now, what does a hawkish Fed mean? It means rate hikes and QT or quantitative tightening. So over the next few slides, I will share some thoughts on uh, how fast the Fed could hike, how long they could hike, how high they could go, and uh, some thoughts on how EM and Asia would react 
Right, so to kick things off, the first point would be the first step to normalization would be taper. Right, taper, uh, we have to look in the context of how much money printing has been done over the past couple of years due to the pandemic. Uh, and we have to compare that to what is viewed to be normal QE uh, that's been taking place post GFC. So this chart over here shows you the amount of uh, QE that's done by the major central banks, uh, G3, uh, over the past five, six years or so. And you notice that there was a big ballooning over the past two years. So a total of 10 trillion US dollars worth of printing done by Europe, uh, US, and, and Japan. And this is way larger than anything that we saw uh, before that. Right? So with us exiting the pandemic, uh, we are trying to live with the pandemic and the economy is becoming more resilient to it, then we thought that central banks would have to exit these exceedingly loose policies as well. So we, we have a template because the Fed has gone through this before. So after we are done with taper, there will be a short period where the Fed's balance sheet is kept constant. Uh, and after that, uh, you could shrink the balance sheet much like in 2017 to 2019. Right, so the first step is taper. Now, taper into quantitative tightening, there are two effects to consider. The first would be the liquidity impact. Now, what happens during QE is that when the Fed buys an asset, it injects money in the system, and the money is then put into use buying another asset. Now, this goes on until a point comes where some market participant will find that there's nothing interesting left to buy, and in which case the money goes back into the Fed in the RRP facility. So the chart shows you that a lot of the QE that's been done since last year have just been parked back to the Fed. So even as the SOMA holdings, which are the securities that the Fed holds, goes up through QE, what you have is that the amount parked at the Fed has also gone up uh, at the same pace. So that account has about 1.5 trillion US dollars in there. So the meaning is that even if the Fed decides to run QT or shrink its balance sheet at a quick pace, much faster than what we saw, say at 80 to 100 billion per month, it will still take over a year before this facility gets drained down. And even if this facility gets drained down, there's still the excess reserves to consider. So the impact on liquidity, yes, it will go from very, very flush to very flush. So the impact on short-term dollar rates uh, would be negligible. Now, the second impact would be more important to consider, and that would be the duration impact. So when the Fed buys bonds, it takes those bonds away from the market, right? so that there's less for the private sector and all the other major players. So during this crisis, the Fed bought, bought a lot of bonds. right? So it, it now holds about 22% of total outstanding US treasuries. Now, that's a very big amount. right? Pre-crisis, the Fed held about 14% of the total outstanding. And and because the Fed stepped up so much, there's a lot less for the private sector to absorb. Now, what happens during QT is that the Fed's support will slowly erode in the coming months. And if QT is done at a more aggressive pace than was seen previously, it means that the private sector and the other major players will have to absorb more of these bonds uh, in the coming months. Right? So proportionally, the hit is felt on the private sector. And the point to emphasize is that the Fed is not price sensitive. When it says it wants to buy X amount of bonds, it would deliver regardless of price. But for everyone else, price is an issue. We would not want to buy it if it's too expensive. And some premium has got to be built into these rates curves. Now, now that we are done with QT, uh, we're moving on to rate hikes or rate cuts. That's something that we are probably more familiar with. Right. So if you look over the past 30 years, we can see that there are four rate hike cycles. Uh, some of the characteristics are put on the table to the right. And there are two things I'd like to point out here. The first is that each cycle lasts from about one to three years. So that there's a finite time. You can't keep hiking for an extended period. Right? Because for economic expansions, if it's something short, it could be five years. If it is something long, it could be around 10 years, right? what we saw post-GFC. And the strength of the economy also matters. Right? If the economy is weak, there's not much scope for the, for the Fed to hide. Right? Beyond a certain point, the economy will not be able to handle. 
right? So, so the time frame is about one to three years. Uh, the second point I'd like to highlight is that the Fed has become a lot tamer now compared to what we saw in the earlier years. So for example, in, in the 90s, the Fed can hike 50 to 75 basis points in one meeting. Right? So by the time we got to the 2000s, they delivered 25 basis points per meeting, but they managed to hike back to back, meaning that in one year, they could go up by 2%. Now 2% is very aggressive by today's standard, because at the last Fed hike cycle, uh, from 2015 uh, all the way to 2018, what we saw was at the peak, the Fed could only deliver 25 basis points per quarter or about 1% per year at the fastest. So I think these are some of these, the things that we should consider when we try to extrapolate how the Fed is going to go. Uh, I mean, if we go blue skies, one per quarter is possible, but if something goes all right, we could always go slower. And there's an outside chance that the Fed might have to do back to back, but that cannot be viewed as a base case. So I've talked about QT, I've talked about rate hikes. Now, how high can they go? So this becomes more nuanced, right? Because we have to think about tightening uh, as well as real rates. So what constitutes tight monetary policy, right? The level of interest rates is meaningless on its own. What we have to consider is where the level is compared to where inflation is. So for example, if nominal rates are at 5%, but inflation is at 10%, that would mean real rates are negative 5%, which is very, very stimulative. So you put it in the context of the US, where inflation is running at 7%, but short rates are at close to zero, uh, that is a very, very stimulative environment at a time when growth and inflation are very high. Right? So the point here is that if we want to look at how much inflation will be uh, a few years down the road, when we are past the pandemic, uh, we're going to look at how the market is pricing the Fed a few years down the road when they're probably done hiking. We look at the five-year, five-year rates. Right? In, in the previous cycle, we can see that if the Fed is tight, real rates can get to 1%. Now, if things go wrong and the Fed has to loosen, then real rates can drop all the way to minus 1. So, so, so that's the range. So at this pandemic crisis in the earlier part of 2020, what you saw was that real rates fell all the way to minus 1.5%, which I think is a record low. So we have climbed uh, some towards about negative 0.7%. Uh, I think it should not be too much of a stretch to have neutral real rates closer to zero or negative 0.5%. Uh, in fact, it might even be considered conservative if we consider beyond just inflation. If we consider that growth in the US and the state of the US economy right now is a lot stronger than what it was post-GFC. So one way I like to think about it in a simple fashion is that if inflation is going to be structurally higher, right? I'm not talking about 7, 6%, I'm talking about 2.5%, like what Timer mentioned. 2.5% could be significantly higher than what we saw pre-pandemic, where the average was below 2. Right? So if you're going to have inflation of 2.5 and neutral real rates of between 0 to negative 0.5, then the terminal can be close to 2, 2.5%. Right, the Fed themselves have guided terminal to be around 2.5% in the dot plot. So it's, to summarize everything in a template, uh, the Fed has been shifting, and uh, we've been communicating to our listeners as well as our readers uh, since the middle of last year. That's the first pivot. And since then, with inflation consistently surprising on the upside, the Fed has to catch up, and has been playing catching up ever since. Right, so we, we went into accelerated taper, into accelerated rate hikes. So we are now bringing forward rate hikes into March. Uh, we see three hikes uh, this year and the next. We think risks are balanced either way. Uh, as for when QT will start, we think that it could start pretty early. In the previous cycle, there was a very long waiting period of almost two years, and they, they waited until the Fed funds rate was above 1%. I think this round with the balance sheet bloated uh, and, and uh, plenty of liquidity in RRP, I think there's no real need uh, for, for the Fed to hold back that long. So I think QT could start sometime in the middle of the year and could accelerate towards an, a cap of around 80 to 100 billion per month uh, towards the end of the year. So all in, I think it has gone from a why hike rates to a why not scenario because uh, policymakers are out of ammo, especially in terms of monetary policy. We are at zero and balance sheets are bloated. If we enter into a crisis now, 
there is nothing much that they can do. Right? So there is a need to build up policy space. And I think this will be a very important factor, not just for the US, but probably across the world. So that concludes it for the US section. Right? I think the takeaway is that the Fed is serious about hiking rates. And it is serious, and the market is also deciding to take it seriously. We got it, uh, we got hit by Omicron. So there was a bit of a scare uh, in, in early December. And it took until early this year when people start to pair this kind of pessimism. Right? So if you look at the 10-year yields, the changes since the start of the year, uh, it is an across-the-board increase, whether it is in the DM or EM. Right? You, even Japan, where, where yields are anchored, uh, it, it, it is hard to avoid uh, where the center of gravity is going, which is it is not just the Fed which is thinking about taper and stopping QE and hiking rates. The other major central banks are following suit. In emerging markets, something similar has to occur. So in my final slide, I'll just share with you some things that uh, I think will happen in Asia. So our colleague Duncan Tan has written something on Asia rates 2022 where there are more details. I think the point is that this year, uh, you'll probably see some volatility in the early part of the year because we need to adjust to a tighter Fed. Right? And then uh, what this means for Asia is that while central banks are still prioritizing growth, uh, it is becoming a little bit more difficult. So it's a bit of a dilemma because last year, a lot of the EMs and Asia economies did not manage to stage a meaningful recovery. Right? Whereas in the DM space, at least growth is relatively strong. So keeping that in mind, uh, many of them would try their best to lag the Fed, but it might be a little bit risky to lag too far from the Fed. So we think that some of these rate hikes probably will have to be front-loaded, uh, similar to what we did to our Fed call, which is to bring it slightly earlier. Right? So it is not all doom and gloom. So there are silver linings. So one of it is that through this pandemic, uh, investors generally did not hit back into EM or Asia. So another way to put it is that there's not much outflow risk because there's not much inflows over the past two years. So if that is the case, what we need is a little spark, right? Where if we are really towards the beginning of the end of COVID, then perhaps growth in EM and Asia can stage a more meaningful recovery in the second half of the year. And in which case, uh, they will be more attractive for investors and start to draw in inflows again. So one last point that I would like to make is the divergence between China and, well, pretty much the, the rest of the DM, right? So China is probably going to ease policy against the US, uh, which is probably going to hide rates consistently, right? There, there, there are two points to note. So one is it is justified for China because they are facing considerable growth challenges, and they should uh, cut rates. Right? The second point is that, are they able to do so? And we argue yes, because there's, there's nothing seriously wrong with the BOP. And, and the second point is that uh, with, with a strong BOP and a stable RMB, they, they are able to run pretty autonomous uh, monetary policy, meaning they can focus very largely on their domestic considerations. So that is one of the key themes that we have and uh, China will be able to resist the draw uh, of higher rates uh, much better than, say, a lot of the other EMs. So with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Maybe we'll have a look at the poll results. Right, Eugene, thank you very much. That was great. So let's look at the poll results. What did everybody have to say? We had about 100 people take part in the polls. And three rate hikes for 2022, 53% thought so. But we also have a bit of an even split between fairly dovish, two hikes, and fairly hawkish, four hikes. What's your sense? It looks like our listeners are reading our report. So that's why we put <laughs> three hikes. I think three, three is a balanced view, right? So, so I think the issue is that, yes, if the Fed could hike once per quarter, they would probably do so. But we also got to consider downside risk. But aside from inflation potentially falling off, quite fast towards the end of this year, or what if China gets into more serious trouble towards the middle of the year instead of bouncing as you expect? So I think three, three is reasonable, four is possible as well. As you shouldn't rule it out because inflation has been quite sticky. Uh, if it's not able to deliver 
three or four, then I think we would have to get a shock sometime later this year. So I suppose among the shocks, you know, one possibility is a very negative shock, disinflationary shock, which is Omicron spreads in a very big way in China. And already China is struggling with the zero tolerance policy and we see significantly major disruption in global supply chain, which leads to inflation on one hand, but disruption in activity on the other hand. So we have a terrible stagflationary scenario, uh, which puts the Fed in a very, very difficult situation. And that could lead to you know, very poor outcome for asset markets. But you could also have the Goldilocks scenario, which is we go past Omicron very quickly. So just what's happened to South Africa, all the other countries follow the same routine. By end February, this nightmare is over, and then we have strong demand-driven inflation while the supply set has not been sorted out yet. And then the Fed is sort of nudged into that strong demand dynamic of needing to yes. hike in a sustained manner. Um, so I think in the end, it is a matter of probability adjustment. Correct. Right? So, so although we have a base case, we also got, got to consider the upside risk to inflation and downside risk to growth as well. Right. Right. Right, so, so I think just from a distribution of scenario outlook, I think this yeah. response has actually summarized that distribution pretty well. That there's like an even odds for a four or two hike around bearish and bullish scenarios, central scenario being about three hike. Yeah. All right, let's uh, go to the next question and see you know, what the view of our authors are, about, our viewers are on the 10-year bond yield. Uh, all right, Eugene, this is all yours. Why don't you look at it and tell us what you think of this? Yeah, so, so it seems that a lot of listeners are quite bearish, right? Two, two percent. I think maybe if we put a 2.5, there will be some, some there as well. So I think it is quite interesting how, how, how markets perception change. Because when I put the 1.8% 10 year forecast for the first quarter, that was my near term target. And, and we ended last year at close to 1.5%. So I didn't expect it to hit within a week. So the repricing is fast because we have been hammering that Omicron is likely to be mild. We've been monitoring the cases in South Africa. But when the market decides to change its mind, it, the adjustment just kicks in. Right? So I think that uh, in terms of overall rates, uh, the way to view it is that some rate hikes have been priced, maybe not very, very aggressive, like four or five hikes uh, a year, but some have been priced, and certainly a lot more than what we saw three, four months ago. And I think the question for me is uh, the terminal rate, right? because did this would drive your 10-year uh, towards 2% or beyond. So, so for my own forecast, I, I have the 10-year rate going towards 2 to 2.5%. And one of the reasons is I think that the US economy uh, is in a far stronger position now, looking at the private sector, compared to the post-GFC environment where the private sector was in serious trouble. So if that is the case, and growth and inflation is going to be higher than what we saw, then does it mean that the terminal rate should be higher than what we saw? Right, so, so that's something at the back of my mind. Right, Eugene, related to that issue is also not just the state of the private sector, but the subset, which is the banking system or the financial yes. sector, which was on a major repair mode in 2019, 11, 12. Uh, so the ability of banks, which were sort of you know, repairing their credit, uh, repairing their balance sheet to withstand any sort of interest rate shock was fairly limited. Whereas now, as you can see, as soon as we see yield curve steepening, bank shares are rallying massively. Yeah. So the view is that the banks can actually participate in this higher inflation uh, environment. And that's a fundamental shift in view from 10 years ago. Yes. So you know, I agree with you that I think the absorption capacity of the economy to higher rates is significantly greater, especially in the household balance sheet and corporate sector balance sheet. Public sector balance sheet, clearly yeah. <laughs> in a weaker state. But what is weak for public sector itself is a complicated question to answer, especially when you're talking about developed markets, which enjoy very high uh, credit ratings yes. and sort of exorbitant privilege of printing reserve currencies. Yes. All right, move on to the next question. I think we're heading into the equity world. Yes, uh, I was looking forward to this one. Will China's equity market bottom in 2022? So 64% is in the camp of yes between very soon and in the second half of this year. And then we have only about a fifth of respondents who believe that another year of loss is ahead. Let me share with you our equity team's perspective. We published our top 10 uh, equity uh, or trade strategy uh, for the year, of which two were from the equity side. And our China, Hong Kong trade strategist, Dennis Lam's view is that uh, we're going to see a bottom very, very soon. And the view is built around reopening trade, 
um, repairment of the supply side, bottlenecks, um, the easing of regulatory action, and sustained fiscal and monetary easing through the course of the year. So I think you know, normally it is sort of the darkest before dawn, and looking at uh, market action in China over the last couple of weeks, we clearly are not off to a good start for 2022. But at the same time, if you want to be a brave investor who wants to pick the bottom, maybe this is the time, and that's maybe what's saying is being said by this uh, response. All right, move to the last question from the poll. We are getting into the Q and A's after this, but the last question in our online poll was in the U.S. markets. What do you like? And by U.S. markets, we really meant the equity market here. Uh, and amazingly enough, uh, we remain tech bullish. So 42% of the respondents so out of 150, 42%. So Eugene, that's about 75 people uh, or 70 people or so believe that tech will remain dominant uh, through the course of this year, whereas about a third believe that the reopening value stock time has come. Uh, and then we have almost a fifth saying that no upside in the U.S. this year. You know, the no upside in the U.S. this year is an interesting call because you could have a bearish view on the tech and a bullish view on the reopening trade, and net-net, it could neutralize itself and give you the option number three, which is not a lot of upside in 2022. Now, why is that the case? Well, because you know, tech-heavy indices, if there's a sell-off there, would drag that down substantially more than any buoyancy we see in the transportation, travel, tourism type stocks. So net-net may not be a very good outcome, even if we have a reopening dynamic playing out through the markets. And also, um, higher interest rates, tighter liquidity, these tend to hurt the more frothy part of the market more. And I think we can all argue tech is where the big froth is at this juncture. Uh, and uh, by that, I don't necessarily mean the Apples and Microsofts of the world, but the medium and smaller sites, tech companies, and also the unlisted part of the market, some of the IPO route, some of the SPAC route, all of that um, fraud could come under a great deal of challenge under a hawkish Fed to the course of 2022. The other point is that if your starting point of an equity market is very high valuations measured as, say, your price earnings ratio adjusted for the cycle, uh, the chance of that high valuation manifesting into high rates of uh, return, nominal or real, over the long term is pretty low. Uh, this is an insight that has been around in the markets for a long time, but uh, Nobel laureate um, Robert Schiller and his uh, website on case, uh, uh, CAPE, uh, cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio, that shows that very clearly, that if you look at the last 100, 110 years worth of data, if your starting point is a very, very high PE over the next 10 years, there is a proportionally lower amount of outcome or return that can come. Uh, now, we don't know that, what that means for 2022, uh, which is why we are okay with uh, the view that 42% you know, think that tech will give one more year a good return. That sort of analysis that I'm talking about, which is starting point of high valuation leads to weaker outturn, that's more of a medium term forecast that over the next 10 years, it is very hard to see the U.S. stock market return the way the last 10 years has been. That's the one point that we have. Uh, okay, uh, so thank you very much to the 150 of you who have taken part in the polls. I think we'll make this a regular feature from now on going into our live stream. Uh, let's now go to the final part of our presentation, which are the questions that were sent by you in advance. I think we have four questions that we have picked for today. Uh, and the first one is about tech. Uh, are U.S. tech stocks truly disinflationary and will be relatively hedged from the current inflationary outlook rate hikes to come? I don't think so. I don't think the U.S. tech stocks are uh, gravity-free, uh, higher rates, tighter li liquidity, in part a gravitational pull on the equities. We saw this in 2001. Now, you could argue that it's not like 2001 at all. Tech companies are based on far greater fundamentals. They have serious revenue. Uh, the speculation element is much less. All of that is correct. But at the same time, for a multi-trillion dollar company to be characterized by a PE of 35, 37, uh, it's hard to justify significant additional growth to, to uh, uh, see that uh, panning out for the medium term. And the moment on the margin you have higher interest rates or lower liquidity, uh, that thesis comes into a serious question. So the equity valuation models tend to look at, among various things, the yield gap. How much yield is being offered by the safe assets? How much yield is being offered by the equity? 
And the equity yield is basically the inverse of P, E over P, earnings per price of the share. And that is now yielding perhaps about 3%-ish or 2.7, 2.8-ish out of the US market. So as you heard from uh, Eugene, if 10-year goes past 2% in the next couple of quarters and head towards 2, 2.5, then all of a sudden safe asset medium-term return is pretty attractive relative to a risky proposition of stocks. So when you had 10-year at 1.5 and, and near term at zero, uh, the implied return or the yield uh, from the equity side was substantially attractive, even if it is not very large. Now that gap is narrowing, and that's the other reason I would worry about the tech market's outlook for 2022. Uh, but again, uh, time will tell. Uh, next question, is it time to avoid equity investment totally? And all that. Absolutely not. Take into account everything that I said, and still you cannot necessarily build a case for divesting away from equity markets altogether. First of all, equity market spans geographies. I mean, do you really want to get out of China now, having experienced the sell-off of the last year and a half? The timing could be pretty bad because there would be uh, time for the market to bottom out and do better. Would you really want to divest out of India, which has shown a lot of buoyancy in the last couple of years? But perhaps you could argue its reopening trade, its manufacturing upside is just beginning. Would you want to divest away from the U.S. reopening trade? I think that would be unwise. Uh, think about companies like Car well, Carnival and Boeing and all these other companies. I don't have any personal stake in any of those companies. But just by example, I think one can think that travel, tourism, services, uh, events, uh, all the stock market action around that space has significant upside in a year like 2022, when presumably we will see the worst of the pandemic behind us and we'll be living with COVID as a pandemic, as an endemic uh, uh, virus. Uh, so no, this is definitely not the time to get out of stock market unless you are trying to time the market and going to bottom fish once some correction comes. That's very, very risky. Uh, typical uh, empirical studies on equity market related trading strategies show that most investors, even professional ones, cannot time the market that well. Uh, third question, uh, Eugene, let's start talking about you. Uh, you have given us a sense of the 10-year yield and bond market. Maybe recap a little bit for us your bond market view around the rate hike narrative, both for the U.S. as well as for Asia. Yeah, I think, I think the issue is that uh, are we ready for, for Fed hikes, right? So for, for the U.S., I think... It, you have to split, right? So the front part of the curve out to perhaps two years, I think we are somewhat ready. But we are not so sure in year three, four, five. So, so therefore, the terminal is important because if this recovery turns out to be quite strong, then the Fed could well hike much more. So that there is a little bit of uncertainty and this premium has to be priced because previously people are just thinking, oh, downside risk, downside risk, because that has been the case for the past 10 years. But what if there's some upside risk. So, so I think that that's something to keep in mind for, for bonds that are longer duration. Uh, for equities, I think that, uh, like, like you mentioned, some of the more frothy parts of the market have corrected. Uh, in the US, even if you look at the crypto space, you're also seeing sizable corrections. But what about Asia, right? So Asia is a bit mixed. So, so the first early part of this year, I think there will be a bit of volatility. It was just, did we ha all have to adjust to a more hawkish Fed? And it's not just a Fed, because across DM, they generally test tightening. So once this adjustment is done, I think we'll, we'll focus on a better outlook, which we might be able to see better growth in the EM this year, finally. And there's the other point that EM and Asia is generally under own. There has not been a lot of inflows back into EM Asia for two years. So by that argument, there is that scope for a bit of catalyst and you could get some inflows in later this year. Would you expect the narrative play out in a country like Singapore, where now the 10, 20, 30 years are offering plus 2%? Yeah, Singapore is an interesting play. But okay, it is partly a tourism play because we are quite open. And if we do go uh, into this last innings of this pandemic, then Singapore is in a great place to benefit. Uh, Thailand is another. And in Singapore, there's this ad additional benefit where we have MES tightening. So they took one step uh, last year, October, and with 4Q GDP numbers so strong, I think there's also a decent likelihood that they will act again in April. And all else equals, if, if the MES has a strengthening sing near, uh, it could put some downward pressure on sing rates relative to dollar rates. So how this works 
risks is that if the US rates go up by 100 basis points, SING rates tend to go up by less. Right? So this is one of our core views that we've kept to. Uh, we expressed it last year and we reiterated it again this year. So the long end, bit of a gap widening between US bonds and Singaporean bonds. Yes, not just the long end, the short end as well. Yeah, I think in general, they, they will widen out. Yeah. Uh, and China, I think one of your strategies for 2022 is being long China CGVs? Yes, yes. So, so China, we liked it for a long time, right? So, so the issue with holding China is that now the divergence is clear, right? So the issue for China has always been is it justified? So are economic fundamentals weakening? Do they need to support the economy? And, and the answer is yes. Now the second part is, can it do it? Right? So, so for many EMs, it's, it's not possible. You, you, you have to track the Fed. At, at best, you can lag it a little bit. But to go against the Fed would be viewed as somewhat risky. But for China, if you have a lot of control over the flows, and you don't really have a balance of payments problem, and your RMB is stable, even though you, you run into headwinds last year, then it tells me that it, it has the leeway to be able to conduct policy to suit its own domestic dynamics. And in which case, we think that a bit more easing is in our thing. And uh, if that's the case, there will be a cascade down into somewhat anchored EUs in the two-year to five-year sector, in contrast to, say, two-year to five-year US EUs, which are rising because of better expectations. So yeah, I think this, this divergence is one of the big themes that we have to watch out for this year. We're really running out of time. In 10 seconds or less, India. Yeah. India is starting to tighten my monetary policy, right? It's not so much on the hike side, but they, they are withdrawing liquidity. And uh, I think the, the, the point is that it too cannot lag the US by too much. It got a little bit of respite with the fall in oil prices, but if global demand is going to be resilient, then that tailwind would be snapped out pretty quickly. I'm beginning to see investors ask a lot of questions of the marginal weakness in the rupee around yes. the higher fuel price, and yes. that seems to be one concern for 2022. I think that's a general concern for Asia, that even if inflation is not a very big headache, fuel price inflation has negative implications for the balance of payments, for the currency, for fundraising, uh, for external sustainability, and so on. All right, less than two minutes left. Last question was, despite liftoff, growth outlook doesn't look that bleak, with many countries still lagging with plenty of room to bounce and less damaging COVID variants, can EM growth save the world? Um, so EM has pockets of strength and pockets of severe weakness. So if you look at countries like, well, these are outside of Asia, so you know Argentina and Turkey and Lebanon and Brazil, Mexico, uh, and then many countries in Africa and the Middle East, uh, Already 2021 has been a terrible year, and 2022 around high, higher Fed rates is going to be very, very challenging because these countries rely substantially on the funding of their current account on the U.S. dollar market, and that cost will go up substantially, which has negative implications for their exchange rates, negative implications for their current account, and perhaps also, by extension, negative implications for growth. So emerging markets, there are parts which will show uh, tantrum in response to the Fed taper and rate hike. Thankfully, most of Asia will not be in that category. Nine years ago, when in 2013, we had the taper tantrum phase, Indonesia and India were in the eye of the storm. Uh, we have presented substantial analysis in the last couple of uh, months uh, that show that from an external metric, uh, these countries are substantially better than their EM peers, and therefore we don't do think that they can withstand uh, the higher interest rate in the US and some degree of volatility in the FX markets quite well. Uh, they will both, India and Indonesia, see some degree of re reopening dynamic. Hopefully China will too. If you have these three big chunks of EM, China, India, Indonesia, growing on the back of handling COVID, on the back of normalizing the supply chain, and maybe some degree of policy recalibration vis-a-vis -vis the Fed, it can still do pretty well and be a major pull for the global economy. So we will keep that hope in the back of my, our mind as we keep looking at the markets and economies around the world. So with that, we are totally out of time. We'll end our January Macro Insights live stream. Eugene, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. And thanks to my GSEMC yes. colleagues behind the screen for their fantastic support. Uh, we will see you next month. Uh, stay happy, stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye.